I've titled this Righteousness by Faith in Verity. I think we are living in very, very serious times. And as we discussed in the previous section, the world is very, very close of making a choice that we have no other king other than Caesar. And when the world makes that choice, then we will have reached the same position that the Jews reached just before their probation closed. And so we need to understand what righteousness by faith really means and why we are the ones who should be preaching this more than anyone else. A few months ago, Tony Palmer attended a meeting with evangelicals and there it was claimed that Protestantism had basically reached its end with the signing on the Joint Declaration on Justification by Faith. And since then there have been major movements and the evangelical churches and the charismatic movement have met with the papacy and they've come to the conclusion that it's better to move towards unity. And the Joint Declaration on Justification shows that Catholicism and Protestantism are basically on the same page. Now, is this really the case or is it not the case? And we need to understand this issue because this is the pivotal issue around which the final events will culminate. It's a very, very serious issue. There is a true righteousness by faith. There is a false righteousness by faith. And there is a syncretistic righteousness by faith, which seems to have the stamp of approval in the biblical sense, but in actual fact, being syncretism, it is truth mixed with error and is more poisonous than blatant error. If we do not understand this issue, then we might just miss the point and choose no other king but Caesar. So what is righteousness by faith? And why is the title Righteousness by Faith in Verity? In order to resolve this, we will start with biblical righteousness by faith. And we're going to concentrate on justification. We're not going to concentrate on sanctification. Sanctification is important, and we will mention it, but we're going to concentrate on justification because that is what the Joint Declaration is all about. Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So this is a very essential religious theological issue. Christ and his righteousness, we read in Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White, Review and Herald, August 31, 1905. Christ and his righteousness, let this be our platform, the very life of our faith. We have to preach the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Now as Seventh-day Adventists, we are known as the people of the law. And the law is essential if we want to understand the righteousness that comes from Christ. Because if you separate the law from Christ, if you separate it from salvation, then you miss the point and you don't understand the fullness of the everlasting gospel. So righteousness by faith is our platform. 
If we go to Isaiah chapter 11, we find the work that the Holy Spirit is to do in the lives of people and in our lives. And this work is embodied here in this description of what the function was in Jesus Christ himself, which is the ultimate explanation of what, what it entails. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. It is the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That is the definition of what the Spirit is about. And never, never will you find that the Spirit bypasses the understanding. The understanding is part and parcel of the Spirit. And knowledge and wisdom and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked." And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. How often does the word righteousness appear there? So this is an essential component of the work of the Spirit. Today the world is seeking a different spirit, an experiential spirit. But the true spirit will never bypass understanding and knowledge and wisdom and counsel. Now if we go to Revelation chapter 14 where we have the three angels' messages and we come to the third angel's message, it reads as follows. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is the most serious warning in the New Testament regarding the final events on this planet. If you receive the mark of the beast, then you will suffer the consequences and it will be without mixture. So what will not be mixed into the cup? There's no mercy. So there's no mercy mingled with the wrath. No mercy. Because you've made a decision to reject God and to accept the mark of the beast. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Day or night, who worship the beast and his image, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, they shall not enter into his rest. They have no rest. They have missed the point what it means to rest in God. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So this message is the final message of warning to go to the entire world. And there's one church in particular that preaches this message worldwide, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist church. And it applies this message to the mark of the beast, which the beast itself claims is Sunday worship. And the reformers had no problem in identifying the beast as the papal system, and they used the prophecies of Daniel to base their exegesis on. So once you've come to the rest, 
and the warning against the mark, here are the, the patience of the saints, here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So this is the preaching of the Sabbath and the entire law, but it has to do with rest. So if we go to the biblical doctrines that are preached by this church, then we find a few landmark biblical doctrines. We read in the Spirit of Prophecy, the passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary. Transpiring in heaven and having decided relation on God's people upon the earth, the first and second angels' messages and the third unfolding the banner on which is inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So embodied in the three angels' messages, you have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God, seen by his truth-loving people in heaven, and the ark containing the law of God. So the law is part and parcel of this message. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. So the old landmarks, the very reason why this church came into existence was to preach the three angels' message, to uplift the law of God, and to put the Sabbath back into a right setting. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out of the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by, man, by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. To them. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They've been given the work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Now we've read this many, many times, but it seems that we have to read it many more times before we will finally get the message. This is our job. And nothing else must occupy our attention. It is the most important message that the world has ever received and it's entrusted to us to give this message. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 365. Concerning the law proclaimed from Sinai, Nehemiah says, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Quoting Nehemiah 9. And Paul the apostle to the Gentiles declares, The law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good. Quoting Romans. This can be no other than the Decalogue, for it is the law that says thou shalt not covet. While the Saviour's death brought to an end the law of types and shadows, it did not in the least detract from the obligation of the moral law. On the contrary, the very fact that it was necessary for Christ to die in order to atone for the transgression of that law proves it to be immutable. Now there are a few points here that I have to point out that are very important. Because the whole issue of salvation and atonement is changing in the world today. And what we are reading here is totally the opposite of what Catholic doctrine stands for regarding this issue. The opposite. 
Now the question that I have is this which stands here in line with Protestant doctrine? And if it is in line with Protestant doctrine, which Protestant doctrine? Early Protestant doctrine or present day Protestant doctrine? Because you see, doctrine can change. And times change. But I don't believe that Rome ever changes. So something must have changed. And if we don't understand the issue of righteousness by faith and the relationship of law and grace, then we will be swept away and take the pen and ask, where must we sign? And when we sign that document, then we are as verily saying, we have no other king but Caesar. That's signing away your salvation. And if you do it for your church, then you are saying, his blood be upon me and upon my children. This is a very serious issue. You see, we live in a world where the religious Protestant world wants to separate law and grace. You cannot separate law and grace because then you lose the issues that pertain to salvation. Because it says here, the very fact that it was necessary for Christ to die in order to atone for the transgression of that law proves it to be immutable. Where there is no law, there's no transgression. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. If there's no transgression, there's no need for grace. So I cannot be without, I cannot be under grace if there is no law. This is Adventist position. So the law stands. The law is immutable. The law sentences me to death. I am a sinner doomed to die. Who will pay the price for me? Nobody can pay the price for someone else's sin, except him or he in whom we are corporately present. So in Adam all die, because everybody was corporately in Adam when Adam sinned. Is this logical? And when Adam sinned, his entire prosperity could only inherit that which he had to pass on to his posterity. And that was mortality. So his posterity was doomed to die. He also couldn't pass on a, a system of righteousness because he had sold his righteousness. So all he could pass on to his posterity was a propensity to sin. So we are all born to die and we all have a propensity to sin. No man can pay the price. No angel can pay the price. The only one who could pay the price is the one in whom Adam was before he was. And who's that? That's God. That's God. So in other words, all humanity was corporately in God before Adam was created. So the only one who can pay the price corporately for humanity is God. So if Jesus is not God, then I am still in my sins. Because no man can die for someone else and no man can raise someone from the dead unless he has life within himself, can lay it down and take it up and give it to whomsoever accepts this gift of salvation. Now it says here that Jesus had to die because the law was immutable. So the law and the immutability of the law is the reason why Jesus had to die. 
Now, that's the Adventist position. It's also the biblical position. Now, what is part of this message? Health reform, the right arm of the third angel's message. When properly conducted, the health work is an entering wedge. Making a way for other truths to reach the heart. When the third angel's message is received in its fullness, health reform will be given its place in the councils of the conference, in the work of the church, in the home, at the table, and in all the household arrangements. Then the arm will serve and protect the body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Know ye not that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Does God want us to take care of our bodies? Yes. yes. Why would he have a care about that? Who designed this body? God designed this body. So who knows what this body requires? God knows what it, what it requires. So he has written it in his Bible. He tells us what our diet was, what we are designed for, and he's given it to the prophets, and he's put it into his typologies, and he's given it as a special gift, a health message to the final church. You feel a deep interest in the circulation of the health publications, and this is right? But the special branch is not to be made all absorbing. The health reform is as closely related to the third angel's message as the arm to the body. But the arm cannot take the place of the body. The proclamation of the third angel's message, the commandments of God, and the testimony of Jesus is the great burden of our work. The message is to be proclaimed with a loud cry, and it is to go to the whole world. The presentation of health principles must be united with this message, but must not in any case be independent of it, or in any way take the place of it. Okay. So the health message is part of the third angel's message. Am I right? It's part of the right arm. Testimonies, volume 5. New believers to have a clear understanding. As the end draws near, and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes, what does it say there? More important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies which God in his providence has linked with the work of the third angel's message from its very rise. All right. So the third angel's message is not just, don't accept the mark of the beast, you must keep the Sabbath. The third angel's message is much more than that. We can see that the, the entire health message is associated with the third angel's message. The entire spirit of prophecy is associated with the third angel's message. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them through the, by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. Never a time. So God wants us to make this part and parcel of the message, not to make it less prominent, not to make it a sideline issue, but to make it part of the third angel's message. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. This is the message. Did you get that? Righteousness by faith is the message. That's the heart of the message. What are the components of the message? The commandments of God? The Sabbath in particular? 
the health message, the spirit of prophecy. And those must be incorporated into the very essence of the message, which is the third angel's message in verity, righteousness by faith, justification by faith. All right? So, people say, you Adventists, you're legalists. You say you must keep the commandments of God. You're legalists. We answer, no. We do not keep the commandments in order to have any stature with God. We keep the commandments as a consequence of His saving grace. He saves me and He brings me into a relationship with Himself. Now Jesus, does He force Himself upon you? Doesn't the Bible say, I stand at the door and I knock? All right? So what's my job in this whole plan? Open the door. That's my plan. That's my only, my only job. Open the door. And then what does he do? He comes into what with you? Sup with you. Now if you go and eat with someone, we discussed it in the previous talk, then you have a relationship with that person. And because you have allowed him to come in, it means you have given him the permission to transform you. Now who does the transforming? Do you want to be made whole? Who does the transforming? He does. He does. Now what's the evidence that I opened the door? What's the evidence? The right to keep, do his will. Yes, doing his will. Now who does his will? Is it me who does it? Or is it me who permits him to do it in me? The latter. Because I cannot contribute in any way to my salvation. So the fact that I open the door and I let him in means I give him permission to do his will in me. So when a book of remembrance is written and the book is opened and the book of remembrance is read to the angelic host one day, will it say there how great we all were? Or will it merely say what we permitted God to do in us? That's righteousness by faith. I accept it. And the fruits of righteousness are doing the will of God. All right, now let's unpack that a little bit. So if I accept the righteousness of Christ, and righteousness just means doing what is right, and he's the perfect divine power in this righteousness who justifies me and then through sanctification and his indwelling work in me, transforms that which was my tendency into his tendency. Now, if I say I don't want to keep the commandments, have I accepted him by faith? Have I opened the door? All right, let's go one step further. If the message is righteousness by faith, in verity, the third angel's message, on which is inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, if I refuse the health reform message, excuse me, yeah. help me, yeah. can, I, can I accept part of his righteousness or must I accept it all? Oh. All right, now if he wants to, bring me back to that to which he intended in the first place, being created in the image of God, that includes the package deal of the, the spiritual as well as the physical, doesn't it? Now what if I say, all right, I'll, I'll let you work, but I don't accept the instructions you've given in the spirit of prophecy. If it's associated 
with the third angel's message, and the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, then what am I, what am I refusing? His righteous instruction. I'm refusing his righteous instruction. So this is a very serious issue. And this should make everyone who has ever been part of this message sit up and say, excuse me, does this mean that God wants all of me? Or can I uh, hold back? It presents an uplifted Savior. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. The sacrifice, please listen to the wording, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in the obedience to all the commandments of God. All the commandments of God. So if I accept righteousness by faith, and I don't permit God to change that which is my carnal nature, then I haven't accepted righteousness by faith. So I cannot separate obedience and law from righteousness by faith. I cannot be under grace and not be under law. I must be both. So the principles of the Ten Commandments, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, existed before the fall and were of a character suited to the condition of a holy order of beings. After the fall, the principles of those precepts were not changed, but additional precepts were given to meet man in his fallen state. A system was then established requiring the sacrificing of beasts to keep before fallen man that which the serpent made Eve disbelieve that the penalty of dis disobedience is death. The transgression of God's law made it necessary for Christ to die a sacrifice. Now you're wondering... Excuse me, why are you highlighting that? Don't we all know that? Well, we might know it. This is Adventist doctrine. I tell you too that it's biblical doctrine. But Catholicism doesn't teach that. And we need to know that. We need to understand that. So it was necessary for Christ to die. The transgression of the law made it necessary for Christ to die, a sacrifice, and thus make a way possible for man to escape the penalty and yet the honor of God's law be preserved. The law and the sacrifice on the cross are linked with everlasting chains. If I take the law out of the issue, where there is no law, there's no transgression, the entire plan of salvation shatters because there's no need for a cross. Are you with me? And if there's no need for a cross, then my salvation must be possible by some other way than the sacrifice on the cross. And then it's no longer righteousness by faith, in the Son of God who paid the price for me, then there's another way. It's the way of Cain, but not the way of God. This is a very serious issue. And we're going to deal with the joint declaration where people take up a pen and sign a joint declaration with organizations that believe that this was not necessary. This is a very, very serious issue. So we know now that the law and the sacrifice, according to the spirit of prophecy, are linked and cannot be separated. Because at the cross, mercy and justice kissed each other. Justice demanded the death penalty. And Christ, having mankind corporately in him, paid that price 
so that I can be set free if I accept the gift of salvation and allow him to change me so that the old man dies and the new man is resurrected in him and it is not I that live but he that lives in me. Isn't that biblical? All right. Let's make sure we have this straight. Because when we come to the faults, we have to make sure that we stand on the foundation of the word of God. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is the death penalty. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come into, unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature. So how do we have redemption in Jesus? According to the Bible. Through his blood. Was his death necessary? Yes. Why? Because he took the curse of the law, the death penalty, upon himself. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. So he was fully God and he had to be. Because if he wasn't God, he couldn't pay the price for me. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, he had to die. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through his death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. The only way I can be unreprovable and unblameable in his sight is if I'm covered by his righteousness. If you continue in the faith, can I fall away? Can I turn my back on that righteousness? Yes, I have a freedom of choice. He's not going to force me. So it's not once saved, always saved. Grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in the, these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So he's the creator, right? Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Is he therefore the recreator as well? Okay. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So the Bible is quite clear. We're saved through the blood. The death on the cross pays the price that is for me. He is the creator. I had no part in the creative act. Because Adam wasn't even there when everything was created. And when he was created, he was fully formed. He had no part in it. And likewise, he will have no part in the recreative act. This is very important. Because we will see that there is this dichotomy of thought. So he paid the price for redemption as well. Now, Manuscripts release, 
5.48, the wrath of God. These are all essential components because we'll see that Rome has the opposite view. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. These words show us why God's wrath descended on his only begotten Son, why the innocent suffered for the guilty, why the just bore the punishment wholly due to the unjust. Jesus came to bear the penalty of man's transgression, to uphold and vindicate the immutability of the law of God and the rectitude of his government. He came to make an end of sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Is that in accordance with biblical doctrine? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the wrath of God fell upon Jesus. Catholicism will say, okay, so God the Father now hates the Son. Excuse me. Excuse me. Is that biblical doctrine? Doesn't Jesus say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? The Father and I are one. So this is a joint decision, isn't it? It's not two separate entities here deciding that I'm going to smack you because of whatever reason and uh, I suddenly hate you. No, God hates the sin. He never hates the sinner. So how much more so will he hate the sin that Christ took upon himself that squeezed out the life out of his beloved son? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All right? So the wrath of God falls upon the sin that Christ took upon himself. But he being without sin himself didn't, couldn't be held in the grave. So he rose from the dead. And anyone who allows him to change us, who allows him to change you or me, will be part of that resurrection. The Son of God, undertaking to become the redeemer of the race, placed Adam in a new relation to his creator. He was still fallen, but a door of hope was open to him. The wrath of God still hung over Adam, but the execution of the sentence of death was delayed, and the indignation of God was restrained because Christ had entered upon the work of becoming man's redeemer. Christ was to take the wrath of God. This is Adventist doctrine. Which in justice should fall upon man, he became a refuge for man, and although man was indeed a criminal deserving the wrath of God, yet he could by faith in Christ run into the refuge provided and be safe. In the midst of death there was life if man chose to accept it. We must understand this. So let's go back to the Bible. We always want to make sure we're, we're in harmony with the Bible. So he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. And the two believers are slightly different. The one is pastua, which is to have faith in, upon, or with respect to a person or thing, that is credit by implication to entrust, especially one's spiritual well-being, to Christ, to commit, to put yourself in Christ. So he that believeth on the Son is he who hands himself over to God. And he that believeth not is a different word, a pateo, it means to disbelieve or not to believe or to be disobedient and to obey not. So if you obey not and you disbelieve, then you will not see life. So that's a choice, either one or the other. To break down the barrier that Satan had erected between God and man, Christ made a full and complete sacrifice. Revealing unexampled self-denial, he revealed to the world the amazing spectacle of God living in human flesh. Doesn't the Bible say he was God manifest in the flesh? Unless, of course, you have a new translation. And sacrificing himself to save fallen men. What wonderful love. 
As I think of it, I weep to think that so many of those who claim to believe in Christ are encrusted with selfishness, living for self, they know not their Savior. Oh, that they had more faith, more love, if they entered into God's work in the Spirit of Christ. If they knew the power of His grace, they would be imbued with holy zeal. They would labor earnestly to give the Lord's workmen in needy, difficult fields every possible advantage. With their prayers and with their means, they would compass sea and land to establish memorials for God. So we must rest in this work. We had no part in it. Only the Creator God can establish it. Six days shall your work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest. To the Lord, whoever doth work therein shall be put to death. That's why we discussed the importance of the Sabbath in the previous presentation. For God has not appointed us to wrath. It says in Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So yes, you will die, but God doesn't want you to die. He doesn't want you to die because he died for you. He wants you to accept this rest and to rest in his completed work and to allow him to complete the work in you. He shall cover you with his wings. He's the refuge, Romans 5. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. That's a big word, this katalega exchange, figuratively adjustment, that is restoration to divine favor, atonement, reconciliation. So the NIV actually uses the word reconciliation, but atonement is, is so much deeper because atonement includes blood. Includes the blood. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, in this case, Paul uses the perfect passive verb to describe a completed justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The perfect passive in the Greek denotes a past event which has an abiding <coughs> result. But we've seen, once saved, not always saved. But if you are justified, it is a judicial decree. It is a legal precept. Mm -hmm. This person is just because he is covered by the righteousness of Christ. It's a legal decree. So in Romans 3, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption, that's the ransom, that is in Christ Jesus. So this justification is this legal act of Christ covering me with His righteousness. I am by no means perfect. I am a fallen being with a propensity to sin. But I have accepted Christ as my personal Savior and opened the door and asked Him to come in. And this very act of accepting by faith His righteousness covers me legally. Amen. Then comes the process of sanctification, which is the work of a lifetime. And God looks at the tendency of the heart and the will to emulate Christ. And he works with my nature, transforming it imperceptibly. I will never notice it, and I will always see his righteousness and myself in my patheticness. But even justification is laying man's glory in the dust, so that I cannot claim any part of it it is wholly His. And why I need it 
is because I am pathetic. Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, there's that great word, hilasterion, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. I've got nothing to boast. By what law? Of works. How can I do works if I'm dead? To be justified, I can't do anything. It's a gift. Nay, by the law of faith. And this great word, now this is what's so fascinating about the Bible, this great word, propitiation, hilasterion, listen to what it means. It means an atoning victim, but it can also mean the lid of the ark, the mercy seat. And he uses that same word to translate it into that very word. Psalm 17 verse 8, Keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. This is this metaphor for his justification. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. And then Hebrews 9, Paul uses these words, and over it the ark of the covenant, the cherubim, the glory shadowing, the mercy seat. The same word, illustrium, for the propitiation of our sins, of which we cannot now speak particularly. And on the day of atonement, the blood was sprinkled on this mercy seat. So this mercy seat in pure gold shields me from the wrath of God. And it was 1.5 cubits high, and the grid of the sacrificial altar was 1.5 cubits high. The justice of God, which demanded the death of the Lamb, is as high as the mercy that shields me from the law's condemnation. It's a marvelous system. And above the ark, the two angels looking down with wonder at the mercy seat that God should have paid this price so that I can live. So can we agree that the biblical doctrine of the death of Christ on the cross and his blood, and Hebrews says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin tells us that the law is immutable, cannot be removed, and therefore the penalty was paid by Jesus Christ. The law condemned me to death, but thank God the mercy seat shields me from that wrath. And God took that wrath upon himself when he took all my sin upon him, and it crushed the life out of the Son of God, and by his blood, which was sprinkled on the mercy seat, I'm saved. Biblical doctrine, yes or no? Okay. Here's the Heidelberg Catechism. Question 60. How are you righteous with God? Answer. This is the reformer's faith. Only by a true faith in Jesus Christ, so that though my conscience accuse me that I have grossly transgressed all the commandments of God and kept none of them, and am still inclined to all evil, notwithstanding God without any merit of mine, but only by mere grace, grants and imputes it to me. The perfect satisfaction, righteousness and holiness of Christ, even so, if I ever had had nor committed any sins, yea, as if I had fully accomplished all that obedience which Christ has accomplished for me, inasmuch I embrace such benefit with a believing heart. I can say amen. I can say amen. That's reformed faith. So Adventism stands firmly on the reformed faith. Now, 
modern Protestantism wants to remove the law. And then the whole, the whole plan of salvation collapses. Because if the law is go gone, then there's no transgression, then God needn't have died. Then we come close to Catholic doctrine. So it is transformed Protestantism that can lead Protestantism to a joint declaration with Catholicism. Let's just make sure. Martin Luther. Why did you believe Martin? It's no, no secret that I like Martin Luther. Eh? Just in case you didn't remember, I like Martin Luther. Martin Luther maintained that this truth was the difference between a standing and a falling church. If a church upholds the truth of justification by faith alone, we're talking about justification by faith, we're not talking about sanctification, okay? Then in Luther's judgment, it was a standing church. If they did not, then it was a falling church. The importance of the truth of justification by faith alone is also evidence in the fact that the two creeds which arose out of the Reformation, the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism, maintain and defend this truth, and they do so in precise, powerful, and comforting terms. All right. So they all believed this. So what happens to the unrighteous? Revelation 14.10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is, this is a final act of God, totally contrary to his character. So Isaiah describes it in chapter 28, For the Lord shall rise up and mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he might do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass this act, his strange foreign act. God doesn't want anyone to die. God is a God of love. But in order to end the great controversy, he will do it. But only after everyone has rejected him and said, we have no other king except Caesar. We don't want you. And if you say, I don't want you, you reject life because he's the only one who can give it to you. But there is a point beyond which divine patience is exhausted and the judgments of God are sure to follow. The Lord bears long with men and with cities, mercifully giving warning to save them from divine wrath. But a time will come when pleadings for mercy will no longer be heard. God will not force himself upon anyone. Ezekiel says, Say unto them as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil way. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Seek ye the Lord, says Isaiah, while he might be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our garden, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is the character of God. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. This is the third angel's message. How is it made manifest? Obedience to all the commandments of God. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be of grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. This is Bible doctrine. 
Voluntary, our divine substitute, bared his soul to the sword of justice. That we might not perish, but have everlasting lasting life. Said Christ, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up. These are all the texts that we have spoken about. He is truly God. He is the only one who can do it. Mankind was corporately in him. No man of earth or angel of heaven could have paid the penalty for sin. Jesus was the only one who could save rebellious man. In him divinity and humanity were combined and this was what gave efficiency to the offering on Calvary's cross. At the cross mercy and truth met together, righteousness and peace kissed each other. As the sinner looks upon the Savior dying on Calvary and realizes that the sufferer is divine, he asks why this great sacrifice was made. And the cross points to the holy law of God, which has been transgressed. Can you understand why only Seventh-day Adventists can give this message to the world? Why no one else? Why was it entrusted to Seventh-day Adventists? Because of the relationship between law and grace. And if Protestantism has lost that relationship, how can it give the three angels messages? If Catholicism doesn't acknowledge the law of God but changes it, how can it give the three angels messages? So only someone who understands the relationship between law and grace can do it. Now early Protestantism had justification pat on. But they didn't have all the law right, did they? No. They stumbled on a couple of points. So only those who keep all the commandments of God can actually bring the three angels' messages. But if we bring it as the law, and the letter of the law, we miss the point. Because then we are something akin to Pharisees. But we are not, we're Protestants. In fact, by bringing law and grace into the right relationship, we're the only true Protestants that are left. This is a tremendous responsibility. This is why such a tremendous responsibility rests upon this church. We may commit the keeping of our souls to God as unto a faithful creator, not because we are sinless. So we're not great. Don't think we're the bee's knees because God has given us this message. We are sinners, saved by grace. But because Jesus died to save just such erring, faulty creatures as we are. We may rest upon God, not because of our own merit, but because of the righteousness of Christ which is imputed to us. We must look away from self to the spotless Lamb of God who did no sin, and by looking to Him in faith we shall become like Him. By the way, what are the most important senses on this head of ours? The eyes? And the ears? And I think we can just include the mouth as well. So what we hear and what we speak and what we see can transform us. So if we live for the world, we will incorporate the world into our system. If we listen to what the world has to offer and we watch what the world has to offer, it will infuse our being. So we must look unto Christ. And Hebrews 9, 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Absolute biblical pillars. That's why it's incomprehensible that Rome should sweep them all aside, and even more incomprehensible that Protestantism will ask, where do we sign? Unbelievable. So who's standing between the living and the dead here? Adventists. Adventists are standing between the living and the dead. 
When Christ was upon the earth, the people did not believe in him. They rejected the Lord of glory, condemned and crucified him. But the heavenly vine had its roots on the other side of the wall. Death could not hold him. He rose from the grave and sits on the right hand of the Father, the majesty on high, where he can direct the heavenly intelligences, bidding them come to the help of every repenting soul. With the confession of the repenting, believing sinner, he mingles his own righteousness. That the prayer of fallen man may go up as a fragrant incense before the Father and the grace of God is imparted to the believing soul. We should think of what we are to Jesus and of what he is to us. That we may carry on a successful warfare against the flesh and against the natural tendencies of the mind. We are exhorted to gird up the loins of the mind and to do this we must settle the mind upon Jesus. It's the only way to do it. No other way. That brings me now, having spent a considerable time making sure that we understand that our doctrine is not vain. Our doctrine is Bible-based. Our doctrine is Reformed-based. Right? Good. The Roman Catholic view of atonement. In contrast to the rest that we find in the completed work of Christ through the atonement of which the Sabbath is the sign or the mark, it can only be because it comes at the end of the creation. It implies acknowledgement of his ownership through both creation and redemption. Roman Catholicism presents another mark of allegiance which the Bible terms the mark of the beaks. So Seventh-day Adventism and Catholicism are thus irrevocably irreconcilable with regard to these issues. Catholic atonement takes into account the teachings of the fathers and blends them into a unified whole based, based on tradition. So it's not word-based. So let's just make sure. I'm going to quote answers and tracts. This is the Catholic website that answers questions that you pose to them. So this is the official Roman Catholic Church telling us what they believe and what they think of Adventism. They say, Adventists also subscribe to the two Protestant shibboleths. Sola Scriptura, the Bible is the sole rule of, faith, rule of faith. And sola fide, justification is by faith alone. Excuse me. Excuse me. They subscribe to the two Protestant shibboleths. And the two shibboleths are sola scriptura and sola fide. I want to know what a shibboleth is. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to know too? Other Protestants, especially conservative evangelicals and fundamentalists, often attack Adventists on these points, claiming they do not really hold them, which is often used as proof that they are a cult. Now, why do other Protestants attack Seventh-day Adventists? Because of their position on the law. And they say, you're legalists. You don't really believe in salvation by faith. You are legalists because you say you must keep the law. But they don't understand the relationship between law and grace and accepting it by faith. Because here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we've discussed why you cannot separate law and grace. All right? However, along the spectrum of Protestantism from high church Lutherans and Anglicans to low church Pentecostals and Baptists, there is little agreement about the meaning of these two phrases or about the doctrines they are supposed to represent. And I like this statement. I agree with it. Seventh-day Adventism cannot change its views on the Catholic Church being the whore of Babylon. Who's writing this? This is the Roman Catholic Church writing. 
Seventh-day Adventism cannot change its views on the Catholic Church being the whore of Babylon without admitting that it was wrong on the Sunday worship issue. It cannot admit that Sunday worship is not the mark of the beast without changing its views on the Jewish Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventism cannot cease to be anti-Catholic without ceasing to be Seventh-day Adventism. That's fascinating. I wish some of our brethren would read these statements emanating from the pen of Rome. Of course, there's no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath. There's only a Sabbath, which the Jews kept. So don't be confused by the jargon. But they claim that sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone, and sola fide, salvation by grace, by faith alone, are shibboleths. So I have to look up what that means. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it as follows. Shibboleth. An old idea or opinion or saying that is commonly believed and repeated, but that may be seen as old-fashioned or untrue. A word or way of speaking or behaving which shows that a person belongs to a particular group. A word or saying used by adherents of a party, a sect, or belief, and usually regarded by others as empty of real meaning. The old shibboleths come rolling off their lips. So Rome is quite clear. It doesn't believe in sola scriptura. We've known that. They believe in tradition as well. But they don't believe in sola fide either. So justification by faith is a Protestant doctrine. And when Protestantism compromises that doctrine by uniting with Rome, then it as verily denies that Jesus is their king as the Jews did. Now, in the next lecture, we will see exactly what is Rome's position on justification. And we will see what Rome's position is on the atonement. And when we understand that position, we will be horrified to see that the joint declaration is a compromise which is so brilliantly written that even discerning Protestants have put their pen to it. May God help us as the bearers of the third angel's message not to fall into that trap. Amen. Amen. Now in the first part of this lecture, we looked at righteousness by faith. We looked at the Adventist view. We looked at the early reformers view. And we looked at the Bible. And we all came to the conclusion, I believe, that they were all in harmony with each other. Now we're going to look at the Catholic view. And then we'll compare it with the Bible and with the Adventist view. And then we'll make some conclusions, and then we'll look at the joint view and see where that brings us. Now, this is the Catholic Encyclopedia, and it says, instead of seeking a solution in legal figures, remember, we spoke about the legality of the plan of salvation, Christ taking upon himself the sin, and then paying the price for those sins, and then imputing and imparting his righteousness, and that the imputation was a legal framework. So Catholicism says, no. Instead of seeking a solution in legal figures, some of the great Greek fathers were content to dwell on the fundamental fact of the divine incarnation. By the union of the eternal word with the nature of man, all mankind was lifted up, and so to say, deified. Now, the Catholic Encyclopedia tells us that Christ became man so that we might become God. Uh, that is very reminiscent. In fact, it's exactly what the serpent said 
in the Garden of Eden. He was made man, says St. Antanasius, that we might be made gods. His flesh was saved and made free, the first of all being made the body of the word, then we being concorporeal therewith are saved by the same, and again, for the presence of the Saviour in the flesh was the price of death and the saving of the whole creation, and they quote Adelphium, and like manner, in like manner, St. Gregory of Nazianzus proved, proves the integrity of the sacred humanity by the argument that that which was not assumed is not healed, but that which is united to God is saved. Okay. So this is a very interesting doctrine that we have here. And we can see that the Greek fathers are the ones who are involved in this. Now in Catholic thinking, it's not the Bible that's the norm, it has to be interpreted in the framework of the fathers. Now what happens when all the fathers are in disharmony with one another? Then you get uh, uh, a very strange phenomenon where you harmonize disharmony because there's no other way of doing it. So everything is part of, of a whole that eventually is contradictory, but by the very essence of its contradiction becomes non-contradictory, if that makes any sense whatsoever to any human being on the planet. So let's have a look at it. And they quote here in Latin, This speculation of the Greek fathers undoubtedly contains a profound truth which is sometimes forgotten by later authors who are more intent on framing juridical theories of ransom and satisfaction. A juridical theory. There's a law. And the law has been transgressed. The law requires retribution, consequence. God takes the consequence upon himself. That's the legal aspect. That's where we came from. Now, they are disputing these juridical theories, as they call them. But it is not only in the connection with the theory of Ramson that we meet with the notion of rights on the part of Satan. Some of the fathers set the matter in a different aspect. Fallen man, it was said, was justly under the dominion of the devil in punishment for sin. But when Satan brought suffering and death on the sinless Savior, he abused his power and exceeded his rights. This is very strange. So that he was now justly deprived of his dominion over his captives. So Satan was in control, but then he abused his power by attacking Jesus Christ. This explanation is found especially in the Sermon of St. Leo and the morals of St. Gregory the Great, closely allied to this explanation, is the singular mousetrap metaphor of St. Augustine. In this daring figure of speech, the cross is regarded as the trap in which the bait is set and the enemy is caught. The Redeemer came and the deceiver was overcome. What did our Redeemer do to our captor? In payment for us, he set the trap, his cross, with his blood for bait. He, Satan, could indeed shed that blood, but he deserves not to drink it. By shedding the blood of one who was not his debtor, he was forced to release his debtors. To atone is to give satisfaction or to make amends for an offense or an injury. Abelard, there's another one, was unable to accept Anselm's view that an equivalent satisfaction for sin was necessary and that this debt could only be paid by the death of the divine Redeemer. He insists that God could have pardoned us without requiring satisfaction. Is that possible? Doesn't the Bible say without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sins? And in his view, the reason for the incarnation and the death of Christ was purely the love of God. So God so loved us that he sent his son and the son lived the perfect life and eventually lived it to the point where he was killed. Not died for us, he was killed. And this does makes the satisfaction. Not the fact that he died, but the perfect life in itself was quite sufficient to do it. 
By no other means could men be so effectually turned from sin and moved to the love of God. Abelard's teaching on this point, as on others, was vehemently attacked by St. Bernard. Do you realize by now that the Greek fathers and the fathers of the church do not agree with each other at all? But it should be borne in mind that some of the arguments urged in condemnation of Abelard could affect the position of St. Anselm. Also, not to speak of later Catholic theology, St. Thomas and the other medieval masters agree with Abelard in rejecting the notion that this full satisfaction for sin was absolutely necessary. So, no satisfaction for sin, you don't need to, Jesus didn't have died. At the most, they are willing to admit a hypothetical or conditional necessity for the redemption by the death of Christ. The restoration of fallen man was a work of God's free mercy and benevolence. And even on the hypothesis that the loss was to be repaired, this might have been brought about in many and various ways. There are many ways in which God could have saved you. He didn't have died. The sin might have been remitted freely. Just forgive it. Didn't he do that for Mary, according to them? Hmm? Wasn't Mary born immaculate? She was born without sin or the consequences of sin by a divine decree. Is that possible when the Bible says without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sin? So if God could have done it for Mary, why did he not do it for all of us? Could have saved himself a lot of trouble, couldn't he? And a lot of pain. Why did he do it? Just declare everyone righteous, that's it, finish, divine decree. So without any satisfaction at all, or some lesser satisfaction, however imperfect in itself, might have been accepted as sufficient. But on the hypothesis that God has chosen to restore mankind and at the same time to require full satisfaction as a condition of pardon and deliverance, nothing less than the atonement made by one who was God as well as man could suffice as satisfaction for the offense against the divine majesty. So some of it seems to overlap with what Protestantism says. A lot of it is totally contrary to what the Bible and Protestantism says. And then they make this amazing statement. On looking back at the various theories noticed so far, it will be seen that they are not, for the most part, mutually exclusive, but may be combined and harmonized. Uh, that takes quite some brain wrenching to achieve. So let's sum up. Here's another Catholic website. And it says, let's look at the atonement. This is the Reformed view. God the Father, wrath, cross. Catholic view. God the Father, self-sacrificial love, cross. He needn't have died. He could have done it another way. But he took it all the way. But it wasn't necessary. The blood was not necessary. They continue, the reformed conception of the atonement is that in Christ's passion and death, God the Father poured out all of his wrath for the sins of the elect on Christ the Son. Now listen how they write it. In Christ's passion and death, Christ bore the punishment of the Father's wrath that the elect deserved for their sins. In the Reformed conception, this is what it means to bear the curse, to bear the Father's wrath for sin. In the Reformed thought, at Christ's passion and death, God the Father transferred all the sins, past, present and future, now listen carefully, of all the elect unto his Son. Then God the Father hated, cursed and damned his Son. who was evil in the Father's sight on account of all the sins of the elect being concentrated on the Son. And Sproul says that here, in doing so, God the Father punished Christ for all the sins of the elect of all time. Excuse me, but that is diseased. Because it totally ignores the fact that Jesus Christ said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God the Father now hated the Son. 
He hated the sin. But he didn't hate the son. And God the Father and, and God the Son collectively made the decision to ransom man and took upon themselves in the form of humanity this sin that is ours and died for it. He didn't, he didn't hate the Son. The Bible says he loved the world and he gave his beloved Son. So this is a total confusion. And then they try to distort the Reformed theology by continuing. Because the sins of the elect are now paid for through Christ's having already been punished for them, the elect can never be punished for any sin they might ever commit. Because every sin they might ever commit has already been punished. For that reason, Reformed theology is required to maintain that Christ died only for the elect. Is that true? Nothing they say here is true. Otherwise, if Christ died for everyone, this would entail universal salvation, since it would entail that all the sins of all the people have already been punished and therefore cannot be punished again. The Catholic conception of Christ's passion and atonement. So first of all, they totally distort Protestant theology. They trash it in their, excuse me, pathetic way. And then they try to uplift their theology as in, in contrast. And they say the Catholic conception of Christ's passion and atonement is that Christ offers himself up in self-sacrificial love to the Father, obedient even unto death, for the sins of all men. In his human will, he offered to God a sacrifice of love that was more pleasing to the Father than the combined sins of all men of all time are displeasing to him, and thus made satisfaction for our sins. All right, let us, let us unpack that. Two kids, two children. Let's call the one Tom, and we'll call the other one, whatever, Johnny. And Tom is naughty, and Johnny is good and sweet and obedient. And uh, Tom decides he's going to modify his father's new car, scratches the paintwork from top to bottom, takes his baseball bat, smashes in the windscreen and the front headlights, and goes berserk on his father's car. But little Johnny cuts the lawn, puts nice flowers into a vase and puts it next to his mother's bed. And the father comes home and he sees that little Johnny was so good that he cut the lawn and showed his love by putting flowers in the vase and decides that Tom can be now be forgiven because Johnny was so sweet and good. Does that, does that make any sense whatsoever? Is there any injustice in that system? It's a ludicrous theology. Now, we don't only want to quote one source and people say, all right, but that's a distorted view of Catholicism. So here are some other sources that reflect the Catholic view. Alan Jones, the Reverend of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, wrote a book called Reimagining Christianity. And in this book he states, the church's fixation on the death of Jesus as the universal saving act must end. In the place of the cross must be reimagined the Christian faith. Why? Because of the cult of suffering and the vindictive God behind it. So God is vindictive because he hates Jesus and he kills Jesus because of our sins so that we can be forgiven. All right, so we don't want the atonement anymore. Let's get rid of that theology. Of the atonement, John say, also says, Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. Penal substitution was the name of this vile doctrine. In 2008, Oprah, and the media is controlled also by the same powers that be, and this is the th theology that is being aired to the masses, even by the media. So she presented... The Course in Miracles, which, by the way, is a channeled work. 
And daily on her Oprah and Friends online radio network, this is what she had Jesus come and say through this channeled information about the atonement. This is Jesus, in inverted commas, speaking. Do not make the pathetic er error of clinging to the old rugged cross. The only message of the crucifixion is that you can overcome the cross. Until then, you are free to crucify yourself as often as you choose. This is not the gospel I intended to offer you. The journey to, cross, to the cross should be the last useless journey. If you can accept it as your own last useless journey, you are also free to join my resurrection until you do so, your life is indeed wasted. The song of Easter is the glad refrain of the Son of God was never crucified. The very tone tells me that it comes from the pits of hell and not from above. All right, is this really possible? Richard Leonard is a Sydney-based Jesuit priest. Here's another quote. Who also was also the director of the Australian Catholic Film Office. And he says on the atonement, so now we have the Jesuit view, which is interesting because the present papacy is controlled completely by the Jesuits. Most of the radio interview titled What to Say to Suffering and Death was interesting, but I found Richard's comments on the atonement particularly so. In the top 10 hymns for Christians right throughout the world, I think, this is the Jesuit speaking, how great their art gets into the top five almost every time. And indeed, I love how great their art. We sang it at Mass only just recently, and I gave it out with great gusto, but I can't sing verse 3. I wander through glades in verse 1, and I shout with acclamation in verse 5, but verse 3 says, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. He, uh, the Jesuit refuses to sing it. Well, I can scarce take it in too, because I don't believe that sort of theology. It comes in at a very particular moment in Catholic theology called the atonement theory from the 11th century. And it is based on Paul's letter to the Romans. So it's got some New Testament roots. But when you unpack those parts in the New Testament, they are used in a particular way that I think have lost their meaning now. About buying back slaves and the whole process of redemption. And then it gets picked up about atonement. And then the Protestant reformers really perfect it in what's called satisfaction theology. That's the only way for God to get happy with the world was the perfect son to make the perfect sacrifice so God's anger would be satisfied. There's another way that you can get into why Jesus died, and that is why was Jesus killed. You know how subtle that is? And I say in the book that maybe it's just more helpful now to say that Jesus didn't come primarily to die, he came to live. And as a result of the way he lived, he threatened the religious, political, and social leaders of his day. So we are socializing the gospel. They put him to death, and that God's response to Good Friday was not to see his only beloved son crucified in a capital punishment death, but was in fact then to raise him from the dead. So God's response to Good Friday is Easter Sunday, which is in fact the cornerstone of Christian theology. So I love how great they are. I just shut up when I get to verse 3. I know it's a very venerable piece of theology, but for instance, the Orthodox Christians, they have not attended to go down this atonement satisfaction way. They tend to be much stronger about what I've just outlined, that Jesus came to live. You see, when the Christians go to Holy Week, to Good Friday, I think we ask the wrong question. We ask, why did Jesus die? I think it's the wrong question. I think the question is, why was Jesus killed? And that completely changes Holy Week. So Jesus was murdered. Didn't die for you. There's no atonement. And Paul says so, but pff, let's forget about Paul. Isn't that what he's saying? Let's forget about Paul. 
All right, let's think a little bit further. Roman Catholicism has some very interesting thoughts. And one of the thoughts is that if you are a sinner and Christ has forgiven you your sin, then justice has not yet taken place. So what about the punishment for the sin? You've been forgiven, but what about the punishment that is due to the sin? Well, that must still come. We still need the punishment. So we'll, we'll invent the punishment. The punishment comes in a place called purgatory. And in purgatory, you suffer the punishment for forgiven sins. Do you get that? So my wife and I have an argument on some silly issue or whatever, and I have wronged her, and uh, eventually I apologize to her, and she forgives me. Then she must beat me up because I haven't yet been punished. Does that make any sense? In a legal sense? No. But now it gets even more interesting. Because who is the one who controls the punishment? Who is the one who, who dishes out the punishment? God dishes out the punishment. And who is the one who can alleviate the punishment? The Pope. The Pope. He can alleviate the punishment. For what? For sins that are already forgiven. And so he alleviates them through an indulgence. So let's unpack this theology. Because it's all wrapped up in this atonement idea that you find in Catholicism that Jesus didn't have to die, he just lived the perfect life, and his perfect life was so great that all the wickedness of all the ages can just be forgiven. So a plenary indulgence was issued by the popes, and the latest popes issued the greatest indulgences of all. 24 hours of forgiveness. This is wonderful stuff. Vatican City, according to the decree made public and signed by Cardinal so-and-so, so-and-so, and Bishop so-and-so, and whatever, uh, in 2012, till the end of 24 November, such and such, you may have a plenary indulgence. Wonderful. Indulgences granted by Pope Francis for World Youth Day. Pope Francis has granted an indulgence to all who participate on the 28th World Youth Day celebrations, which will be held in Rio de Janeiro this month. The decree was signed by Cardinal Manuel so-and-so, along with Bishop so-and-so. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, an indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven. This is their web pages. I'm not making this up with a faithful Christian who is fully disposed, gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church, through the action of the church, which as the minister of redemption, minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of satisfaction of Christ and the saints. I want you to understand this so that you can understand where we're going. As part of the greater effort to use social media to connect with the Catholic worldwide, the Pope will start relieving punishment for your sins via social media. According to the Vatican's sacred apostolic penitentiary publication, Pope Francis will give a plenary indulgence, which is a special act that is said to reduce time in purgatory, to his Twitter followers. The Pope typically offers indulgences to those who see him in person, but for the first time this year, it will be extend to virtual visits too. This is absolutely amazing. To get an indulgence and time off from temporal punishment, you have to have 
a, a cell phone. And you must be able to be connected to the internet, and you must be able to Twitter the Pope's activities. I thought he was the Pope for the poor. Why didn't he give the indulgence to everyone who couldn't afford a cell phone? Or a cell phone contract? Why does he give it only to those who can Twitter him along? This is the most ludicrous, ridiculous thing that I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> now, I know this sounds a little bit sarcastic, but uh, I don't think it warrants very th another approach here. So Vatican's offer time of purgatory to followers of the Pope Francis tweets. I'm giving more than one source so that people don't think we're, you know, making all of this stuff up. Now, what is this the source that he takes this power from? Now, let's look at that. Indulgences granted by Pope Francis for World Youth Day. Pope Francis has granted an indulgence to all who participate on the 28th World Youth Day celebrations, which will be held in Rio. The decree was signed by so-and-so. It's the same thing. It's a remission of sin, of temporal punishments due to sins already forgiven, etc. And uh, it comes from the authority, the treasury of the satisfaction of Christ and the saints. So what is this treasury? Let's ask them. This is Catholics answering this question. The treasure of, treasury of merit consists of the superabundant merits of Christ, as well as the merits of the saints. The treasury of merit is one because of the communion of saints in the body, Christ being the head. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches the following about the treasury of merit. We also call these spiritual goods of the communion of the saints the church's treasury, which is not the sum total of the material goods which have accumulated during the course of centuries. On the contrary, the treasury of the church is the infinite value which can never be exhausted, which Christ's merits have before God. They were offered so that the whole of mankind could be set free from sin and attain communion with the Father. Now there you have the theology, and you must note the theology carefully. It is the merit of his good works which made it possible for us to be redeemed. Not his blood. It wasn't necessary for him to die. So it was the merits of his good works. In Christ, the Redeemer himself, the satisfactions and merits of his redemption exist and find their efficacy. This treasury includes as well the prayers and good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Aha! So the treasury does not only include the works of Christ, it's also the works of Mary. Now how, how big are the works of Mary? They are truly immense, unfathomable, and even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury, too, are the prayers and good works of all the saints. All those who have followed in the footsteps of Christ the Lord and by His grace have made their lives holy and carried out the mission in the unity of the mystical body. And there's, a, there's a flaw hidden in that, and I wonder whether you've perceived it. It says, by His grace have made their lives holy. Who's made their lives holy? They have. Who really makes your life holy? He has. You see there's a shift here? The holiness is actually transferred to the individual who in Catholic theology becomes holy. So it's not Christ who imputes and imparts the holiness, he actually makes them holy beings. Merit cannot be transformed, but meritorious acts can make satisfaction for another. This gets very strange. By giving to God a gift of greater value than that which was taken by sin. This is how Christ's own actions in his passion and death made satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And then we discussed that already. But it is also the way the meritorious acts of the saints can make satisfaction for others, debt of temporal punishment. St. Thomas writes, All the saints intended that whatever, 
whatever they did or suffered for God's sake should be profitable, not only to themselves, but to the whole church. Okay, so this is how the merit is transferred. I have no merit. I'm the little bad boy who smashed my, car's, my father's car. But fortunately, my little brother has lots of merit. So I can transfer the merit from him to me, or from a saint, or from Mary. And well, let's throw Jesus in there as well. Christ gave the power of keys to St. Peter, by which the magisterium of the church, that's the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy and the bishops, as Christ's authorized representatives in persona Christi, can forgive sins by the merit and satisfaction of Christ's passion through the sacrament of penance. Pope Clement wrote, Upon the altar of the cross, Christ shed of his blood not merely a drop, though this would have sufficed by reason of the union with the word to redeem the whole human race, but a copious torrent, where thereby laying up an infinite treasure for mankind. This treasure he neither wrapped up in a napkin nor hid in a field, but entrusted to the blessed Peter. Fascinating. The key bearer and his successor, that they might, for just and reasonable causes, distribute it to the faithful in full or partial remission of the temporal punishment due to sin. So who decides who gets remission of punishment? The Pope. You better get yourself a cell phone and start twittering. And everybody else, it's not a just enough cause. The church, by the authorization of Christ and through the communion of saints, can draw from the one treasury of merit and satisfaction to reduce or remove the death of, debt of temporal punishment for anyone united to the body through sanctifying grace. And that is just what an indulgence is. Who is the one who is the merciful one here? The Pope. He's the merciful one. And who's the one who brings the punishment upon you? God. So the Pope is more merciful than Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose skills have already been forgiven. This is incredible. Through the action of the church, which is the minister of redemption dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfaction of Christ and the saints. Okay. Who decides who's a saint? The church. So, it's official. John Paul II and John the Twenty-Third to be canonized. Why those two? Blessed Pope John the Twenty-Third and John Paul II will be canonized April 27, 2014. So that's taken place. In a statement released, the Vatican said that Pope Francis decreed that Blessed John XXIII and John Paul II will be enrolled among the saints on April 27, the second Sunday of Easter of the Divine Mercy. The Vatican said the Holy Father announced his decision at 10 a.m. and etc., 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 now why? Well, if they have the power to remit sin, then they have the power to determine who is a saint, and then they can take the, 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 the treasury of that saint and apply it, if they wish, to dispense merit. Not only that, if the church has the power to make all of these decisions, based on the merits and based on their theology. Recently, and I know that you are all aware of it, there was this meeting with the evangelicals and Tony Palmer. And I don't want to play the whole piece. I just want to go and start from about the 23rd minute. We want to just look at the last little section. And I need you to at least understand a little bit of the, the history behind this. Because we are living in an incredibly important generation. 
I believe that God has brought me here to this year's ministers' conference in the spirit of Elijah. Let me explain. If you look carefully, the spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers and to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons to prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that prophecy always has a double fulfillment. And we know that Elijah will come before the second coming as well. And I've understood that the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation to return hearts to each other. This is very important. We know that the first thousand years there was one church, it was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal, it doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. <laughs> Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther in his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then, from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course, it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. <laughs> Therefore, Christian unity is the basis of our credibility because Jesus said until they one, they will not believe. The world will not believe, as they should, until we are one. Division destroys our credibility. It is fear that keeps us separated because fear is false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Because most of your fear is based on propaganda. Now, why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. Because in the Protestant Church, we had a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue, because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us two good works. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. 
Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. Good. Doctrines are not important. God will sort out the doctrines when we get upstairs. Put the doctrines aside. Then he read the joint declaration. After what we've discussed already, did you pick up a flaw? How were we justified? Through the blood or through the good works of Christ? His through his merit, his good works. So here is a serious, serious issue already. But let us look at it in some detail because it's important. Because Christianity is at a crossroads. And Christianity is about to sell its birthright for a pot of potash. The Roman Catholic Lutheran Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification is a denial of the gospel and the righteousness of Christ. And the man I'm quoting here is not an Adventist. He's an ex-Roman Catholic priest, Richard M. Bennett. And I thought I would quote him because he's very acquainted with Catholic doctrine, of course, being a Catholic priest. And he has turned his back on it for very specific reasons. So it's good to look at his reasoning and see where it leads us. So he spent 21 years as a Roman Catholic priest in Trinidad. He formally left the Roman Catholic Church and its priesthood. His website is the Berean Beacon at etc. J.D., the Joint Declaration, is the result of 30 years of Lutheran-Roman Catholic dialogue. This fact alone might dissuade many from daring to challenge it. In addition to the first-rate showmanship with which J.D. has been presented, it appears that there is neither grub nor gnat that has not been strained out of this cleverly worded document and addenda. There are presuppositions upheld in J.D. itself which are not stated as such in the official common statement. Some of these presuppositions totally negate biblical justification, as for example the idea that justification is by means of the sacrament of baptism. Such a tradition of men is accepted by both parties to the agreement, which in J.D. states, we confess together that in baptism, the Holy Spirit unites one with Christ, justifies and truly renews the person. This heresy is in line with the teaching of the Council of Trent. Canon 8. If any, ma if any shall say that by the said sacrament of the new law, grace is not conferred from the work which has been worked, but that faith alone in the divine promise suffices to obtain grace, let him be an anathema. You see, Catholic theology says that grace is transferred to you. Christ's work, his merit, is transferred to you. So you become God. You become a meritorious being. The Bible says it is imputed, which is a judicial act, and it is imparted, which is Christ working within you. It always remains with Christ. The present-day dogma of the Roman Catholic Church upholds this teaching of the Council of Trent and declares that it is infallible. From the sixth session of the Council of Trent, the following curses will still stand, and J.D. does not contradict them. Canon 9 says, If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified, so as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification, and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be an anathema. And Canon 11 says, If anyone shall say that men are just justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity, which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and remains in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be an anathema. 
So they totally repudiate Protestant doctrine and biblical doctrine. And then he quotes Romans 9. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. So is Paul also an anathema now? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. The Bible is quite clear. We cannot be saved by our works. We can only be saved by faith in Christ. Error always cloaks itself in reasonably sounding phrases and often makes use of the scheme of the evil one to twist the scriptures. J.D., the Joint Declaration, is replete with Reformation-like language and scripture quotations. A characteristic vagueness and impreciseness permeates the document. Certain sentences can be read and assented to by a biblical Christian. But when the slant of meaning is examined, each is seen to be the opposite of what they first seemed to say. Like when he read this out to that assembly, everybody said, Amen. But they didn't pick up on the error. The conclusions arrived to are similar, and I love this metaphor of his. The conclusions arrived at are similar to the deception of Jacob in Genesis chapter 27, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. The voice of J.D. is distinctly that of the scriptures. The hands, however, are the hairy hands of Rome. <laughs> In J.D., imputed righteousness is cleverly sidestepped for the old lie of establishing one's own righteousness. In J.D., the doctrine of extrinsic or imputed righteousness has been wiped out in favor of the Roman Catholic doctrine of inherent righteousness. Do you understand the difference? Clearly, J.D. is an attempt to do away with the biblical gospel, thus the official common statement to reads, we confess together that God forgives sin by grace and at the same time frees human beings from sin's enslaving power. Justification is forgiveness of sins and being made righteous through which God imparts the gift of a new life in Christ. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. Then they quote Romans. We are called children of God and that we are, they quote 1 John 3, 1, we are truly and inwardly renewed by the action of the Holy Spirit, remaining always dependent on his work in us. Now there's... A huge amount of error in that already, but we'll carry on in a moment. So if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The justified do not remain sinners in this sense. This is what they say. Okay, let's read it again. Justification is the forgiveness of sins and being made righteous. Fascinating. We are truly and inwardly renewed by the action of the Holy Spirit, remaining always dependent on his work in us. Now let's unpack that. This is a convoluted mixture of the doctrines of justification and sanctification. Remember we separated them? Justification is a judicial act of declaring someone righteous and imputing the righteousness of Christ to that person. That's a one-time act. And it has nothing to do with sanctification. Sanctification is the work of a, a lifetime. And also in sanctification, you are not being made righteous. You are allowing Christ to work in with you, and you only have a tendency to want to be like him and permit him to work within you. All right. Justification nowhere in Scripture ever means inherent righteousness or being made righteous. 
The believer's justification is not based on a single iota of anything in him. It is based wholly on his standing in Christ. This is biblical. Just like I had nothing to contribute to the creative act in Genesis, so I have nothing to contribute to the recreative act. A dead person cannot contribute anything. Justification is not being made righteous, but J.D. follows such statements as these with numerous scriptural quotations and phrases cloaking its errors in the semblance of truth. In the justifying act of God, he imputes Christ's perfect righteousness to the individual. It is a legal, one-time, finished, irrevocable act which cannot be misconstrued to be a process or an ongoing occurrence such as the term being made righteous will allow. What is proposed in JD as the doctrine of justification is deficient in two essential ways. It neither upholds the perfect standard of God's holiness, nor does it demonstrate the perfect righteousness of Christ in life and death. In the words of the Apostle Paul, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The Bible is very clear. The Bible emphasizes and declares the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, Romans 1.17. This is not proclaimed nor taught in the official common statement on J.D. Destitute and sinful human beings need the perfect righteousness of Christ. This is what the scriptures clearly says is now manifest. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Romans 3.21 And you will recognize this from this talk that Tony Palmer gave. Together we confess by grace alone by faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Did you read that statement? And everybody said, clap, clap, amen. The latter is sanctification, not justification. And there's definitely no blood in it. Because it's the saving work which does it. And this whole last portion has to do with sanctification. So this is a mixture. This is a convoluted mixture. The simple truth of scripture is that God never accepts an individual as such. Rather he is accepted only in the beloved. In the righteousness of the one Jesus Christ. That is in the righteousness of faith. That's biblical. The official statement ratifying J.D. states. Justification takes place. By grace alone, by faith alone, the person is justified apart from works. They quote Romans. Grace creates faith not only when faith begins in a person, but as long as faith lasts. They quote Thomas Aquinas. Aha! Uh -huh. So they've brought in the fathers. And we saw what confusion the fathers had introduced into the equation in the beginning. Now let's unpack that. The use of the phrase justification takes place rather than the biblical concept to whom it shall be imputed is studied deceit because the word justification can be made to imply a process rather than a one-time act of God. Nevertheless, the scriptures continually speak about the outcome of the justifying act as righteousness, not justification. J.D. in the common statement on J.D. use the noun justification and carefully avoid the verb justifies. The Greek word justifies, logizomai, means to count, esteem, impute, number, reason, reckon. It is a verb denoting a one-time action. The repetition of the noun justification in J.D., and the official common statement on J.D. conveys the concept of a quality within a person 
that totally contravenes the scripture. This is brilliant. These people are linguistic experts at deception. Not mentioning imputed righteousness and continually speaking about of justification is seductive sophistry. Thus in the official common statement endorsement of JD, the basis for the gospel is given as within man rather than the perfect righteousness of the God-man, Christ Jesus. Remember we saw the their doctrine that man becomes God because that which is given from that which is received is one and the same and therefore we must be one. This is cancerous cuisine. And then they cite the citing of Aquinas teaches that grace is a quality of the soul. In the treatise on grace he asks the question, is grace a quality of the soul? In the body of his article, he cites Aristotle's physics, saying, motion is the act of the mover on the moved. That's what we just discussed. Then in reply, he states, grace as a quality is said to act upon the soul, not after the manner of an efficient cause, but after the manner of a formal cause, as whiteness makes a thing white and justice just. So who's made just and who's made righteous? Me. Hello? Did you notice that? I'm not being made righteous. I am declared righteous in the righteousness of Christ. It is a gift that always belongs to him. It's never me. I'm the dependent party, not the independent party. The whole idea of grace being moral justice located inside a person rather than the holy God imputing Christ's righteousness to each person whom he places in Christ blatantly contradicts biblical truth. Such teaching is a negation of consistent biblical teaching of positional legal righteousness in Christ alone. So endorsing the teachings of Aquinas, and all such teaching in JD as justification takes place, being made righteous, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, is quite cleverly teaching inherent righteousness without using the words. Such teaching opposes both the gospel and the righteousness of Christ. On returns to the old lie of Satan, that what is inside man makes him right before God, you shall be as God's. In the Vatican II, Concilia and Post-Concilia Documents, number 42, Reflections and Suggestions Concerning Ecumenical Dialogue, the Church of Rome carefully lays out the ground rules for her program of ecumenical dialogue amongst Christians. From that document, it is clear that the Roman Catholic Church is proceeding to dialogue with Christians by adhering to a special set of rules. Thus they say, Dialogue is not an end in itself. It is not just an academic discussion. Rather, the stated purpose of dialogue is that little by little, oh, that's dangerous, as the obstacles to perfect ecclesial communion are overcome, all Christians will be gathered in a common celebration of the Eucharist. John Rogers, the man who took over the work that Tyndall couldn't complete because he was murdered at the stake, decided to die rather than to accept the doctrine of the Eucharist that Christ was literally, transubstantively present in the host. But now we must all forget about the death of the martyrs and become part of this Eucharist celebration. Into that unity of the one and only church, this unity we believe dwells in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose. The little by little may this time be a giant step as it appears in the conclusion to the official common statement of J.D. quoted above. For the Roman Catholic Church, the first basis on which ecumenical dialogue works is not sola scriptura. The scriptures cannot be broken, John 10, 35. Rather, it is a community of spiritual goods. This basis is exactly the same as the premise on which the Roman Catholic Church builds her doctrine and which is spelled out in her latest official catechism, paragraph 80, 
sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other, for both of them flowing from the same divine wellspring come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. So let's forget about the doctrine. God will sort it out where? Upstairs. Let's just get the thing on paper. Each partner should seek to expound the doctrine of his own community in a constructive manner, putting aside the tendency to define by opposition. So you say so, and I say so. We don't agree, so let's not compare. You stick to what you want to believe, and you stick to what you want to believe, as long as we sign. Where? Here, on the dotted line. Interesting, the Bible teaches much by means of contrast. The partners will work together towards a constructive synthesis in such a way that every legitimate contribution is made use of in the joint research aimed at the complete assimilation of the revealed datum. The words revealed datum are carefully chosen. For a Bible believer, the term would mean written word. For the Roman Catholic Church, however, the term revealed datum consistently refers to scripture plus tradition as a first basis. And proceeding from this impure base, the constructive synthesis rules are simply the old line of evolution, truth by synthesis, or relative truth. Excluded from start to finish is the principle of sola scriptura. To the Roman Catholic Church, who by so exquisite an application of her rules of engagement has thrust through the Lutherans, the words of the Lord speak directly. You are making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered. For those who are the Lord's own within the Lutheran churches, the warning of the Lord is clearly given. Hearken unto me now therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she has cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. I think the man has a way with words. J.D. has ratified on the official, in the official common statement is indeed outwardly stunning. But the message is dead man's bones in that it attempts to cleverly establish man's own righteousness. The word of the Lord's are indeed appropriate. I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I believe there are people out there who are blowing the trumpet while we are silent. And we are watching the world uniting and negating Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And if the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, who should be the ones preaching this message? Shouldn't it be we, us? Shouldn't it be us? Here's another interesting book, Not by Faith Alone. And this again was a Roman Catholic who became a Protestant who then again defected and became a Roman Catholic. And then he became an apologist for Roman Catholicism. And uh, Robert A. Singenes, Not by Faith Alone, The Biblical Evidence for the Catholic Doctrine of Justification. Biblical evidence for the Catholic Doctrine. And here is a response to his work and here's another Protestant writer, and he writes in the Journal of the Grace Evangelical Society. So I'm, I'm speaking about stones crying out. Let's see how he talks about this book. He says, Robert Sanginus grew up in a Roman Catholic home as a young man. He converted to the Protestant faith, decided to go into the ministry, attended Westminster Theological Seminary, etc., graduated then and then and for 10 years was a strong proponent of Protestantism and the Reformed theology. Then he converted to Catholicism and is now an apologist for Catholicism. 
The book opens with a series of endorsements by Roman Catholics, the very first, the most reverend Fabian Bruskevitz, Bishop of Lincoln, who writes in part, Faith implies works. We know that the words we long to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, come and share your master's joy, will be spoken to those who have done well. Faith alone is not enough. The Protestant Reformation sowed confusion about the biblical theology of faith and good works, and many today rely on this confusion to defend or excuse a failure to live holy lives of the service of goodness. And then he praises Roberts. Sungenes has systematically addressed the confusion and demonstrated that we have what we have always known, namely the sacred scripture and the Catholic deposit of faith, are in complete agreement about justification. I applaud this work and recommend it for all who wish to know how and why the Bible teaches that we are not saved by faith alone. Now who sowed the confusion? Was it the Protestants? Or was it the Catholics who sowed the confusion amongst the Protestants? Martin Luther, when he first studied this issue, was a great proponent of Paul and righteousness by faith. And then he studied the book of James, which tells you that faith without works is dead. And he couldn't reconcile the two, so he called James the epistle of straw. And then at one stage, he took off his doctor's hat and he put it down and he told his students, if you can reconcile Paul and James, I'll give you this doctor's hat. And a lot later, he took his doctor's hat and he put it on his own head. Well, what was he saying? He'd reconciled it. Because it depends on how you look at it. If you believe that James is the antithesis of Paul, well, then you have a divided doctrine. You have a divided Bible. So he thought it through. And if the biblical truth is that we are saved by grace through faith alone, then that is a pillar. If faith without works is dead, then that is a pillar. But this pillar cannot negate that pillar. It can only support the building. Both of them must be right. So in what sense can the second one be right? It can only be right in the sense that if I accept salvation by faith, then good works will be a consequence, but not a means to salvation. Boom! The hat goes back on. They keep separating the two. They keep separating them. Wilkin ends his article. This is the one who's writing against it, and he says, the fact that there are diverse, diverse views within the faith alone camp should in no way dissuade people from embracing it. While it is true that the Catholic position has less variance within it, that is not such a good thing. The reason for the agreement is that people within the Church of Rome accept tradition as being on a par with Scripture. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, Hebrews 11 verse 6. We are to search the scriptures, not tradition and scripture, to see if something is true. Each of us should be so committed to scripture that even if we were the only person on earth who believed it, taught justification by faith alone, we would stand firm in that belief. It should not matter to us what percentage of people in Christendom hold the faith alone view. The only thing that matters is what God says. He's got a point. Just because the Christian world today is so confused on this issue, on faith and works, doesn't mean that we should stop speaking about it or just be conciliatory. And who other than Seventh-day Adventists who understand the significance of the law and the significance of grace would be able to give the third angel's message in its fullness. In 2008, in an interview with journalist Emil Hackenes, this is another source, 
The Jesuit professor Edward Kimmon, the then General Secretary of the Netherlands Bishop Conference, proclaimed that there remains hardly any reason to remain Protestant. And he saw Protestantism as an action group that forgot to dissolve itself. And a group that had not recognized the significance of a global, visible leadership personality such as the Pope. Moreover, he stated that he doubted that the Reformation would still exist after 2017. This is getting to be a very interesting date. The year when Protestantism commemorates its 500th year of existence. And Protestantism, he said, should return to the Mother Church. Okay, so Roman Catholicism thinks, just like Bishop Palmer thought, that Protestantism is over. Religious news services reports that the two sides, Protestantism and Catholicism, have decided to bury the hatchet for the upcoming commemoration of the commencement of the Protestant movement. The Vatican and the Lutheran World Federation released a joint document from conflict to communion in Geneva on Monday, June 17, 2013, that said, quote, There is little purpose in dredging up century-old conflicts. In the document, the two churches recognized that in the age of ecumenism and globalization, the celebration requires a new approach, focusing on the reciprocal admission of guilt and on highlighting the progress made by Lutheran-Catholic dialogue in the past 50 years. The fact that the struggle for this truth in the 16th century led to the loss of unity in Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages of church history. Excuse me. And in 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. The document also affirms that the two sides, Lutherans and Catholics, have come to acknowledge that more unites than divides them. We're heading to a very interesting time in history. Hebrews 12, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicators or profound person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Is Protestantism about to sell its birthright? And will they seek it with tears and not find it thereafter? I think we'll take a short break and then continue with where we're heading in the near future. It wasn't long after his speech toward, to the evangelicals that Tony Palmer posted this on his Facebook wall. I'm on my way to Rome for two highly important meetings. The Pontifical Office for the Promotion of Christian Unity and B. Pope Francis. We're discussing the variety and breadth of all our feedback from the publication of Pope Francis's video. And then he said there were 800,000 hits on that particular video. So there must be millions by now. And then, on the 4th of the 4th, he said, Dear friends, thank you for all your prayers and kind comments. Our meetings in Rome were highly fruitful. We spent more than three hours with the Pontifical Office for the Promotion of Christian Unity, which included lunch. And then our afternoon with Pope Francis was like being at home with the wise and gracious Father. He gave me the green light to take the next step. The miracle of unity is happening. And then in June 2014, the evangelicals went to meet with the papacy. And Tony Palmer was still alive. And just thereafter, he suffered that tragic motorcycle accident. 
Televangelists, including Kenneth Copeland and James Robinson, met with the Pope Francis, resulting in the first ever papal high five. This comes from www.charismanews.com. And they state, Two prominent Fort Worth-based Christian ministers led a delegation of evangelical Christian leaders to Rome to meet privately with Pope Francis. James and Betty Robertson, co-hosts of Life Today's television program and Kenneth Copeland, co-host of Believer's Voice of Victory, met the Roman pontiff at the Vatican on Tuesday. The meeting lasted almost three hours and included a private luncheon with Pope Francis. Mr. Robertson told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram this meeting was a miracle. This is something God has done. God wants his arms around the world. He wants Christians to put his arms around the world by working together. Aware that the meeting with the Pope will be troublesome amongst staunch Protestants, Mr. Robertson said he and others visiting other ev visiting evangelical Christian leaders talked about diversity and their belief that Roman Catholics and Protestants could work together without compromising their beliefs. The world is suffering, said Robinson. We as Christians have too much love to share without fighting one another. Isn't that interesting? And then Pope Francis at a rally in the stadium before the Roman Catholic Charismatics, invites them to Vatican 2017. Francis also said Catholic Charismatics have a special role to play in healing divisions amongst Christians by exercising spiritual ecumenism. Fascinating term. Spiritual ecumenism or praying with members of other Christian churches and communities who share a belief in Jesus as Lord. And here he is at the rally. And finally, Pope Francis invited the crowd, which included charismatics from 55 countries, to come to St. Peter's Square for Pentecost in 2017 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the movement. The Catholic Charismatic Movement began during a retreat in 1967 with students and staff from the Kesner University in Pittsburgh. So here you have a jubilee feast. And he says, 2017, let's get together. And they're expecting a spiritual ecumenism. He said, quote, I expect all of you charismatics from around the world to celebrate your great jubilee with the Pope at Pentecost 2017 in St. Peter's Square. Now 2017 is also a jubilee for the Protestant world because in 2017 they celebrate their 500th year which is divisible by 50. So they have a jubilee. It's a jubilee of jubilees. And they said that they want to bury the hatchet, remember? And apologize for the division of the church. Rabbi Judah ben Samuel, in the year 1217, gave a prophecy of the beginning of the end time, which would begin in the year 2017. 1217, he prophesied that the Ottoman Turks would rule over the holy city of Jerusalem for eight jubilees, a period of 400 years. This was fulfilled in the year 1517, when the Ottoman Turks seized control of the city of Jerusalem, ending in the year 1917, exactly 400 years. So the Jews are expecting a mega jubilee in 2000. And 17. He then prophesied a ninth jubilee of 50 years in which Jerusalem would be a no man's land, fulfilled during the British mandate of 1917 to 1967, a period of 50 years 
where Jerusalem belonged to no nation and was called a no-man's land. And then, of course, there was the Six-Day War. And that took place when? 1967. Well, this is what Wikipedia tells us, and those of us who are, are old enough will remember the Six-Day War in 1967. Now add 50 years to that, and what do you get? 2017. So everybody is jubilee jubilant. Everybody is jubilee jubilant. Now, in 2017, Protestants have issued this joint declaration with Rome that they want to bury the hatchet and apologize for the separation of the church. 2017, the Charismatics will celebrate their jubilee. The Pope says, come to, Jerus uh, come to the Vatican. We'll celebrate it together. And the Jews are celebrating their kingdom. It seems to be a great celebration. Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him, because he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jesuit theology says, I think, therefore I am. The only reality is me. I can't see God, so I must rely upon my own reality to decide what is good and what is wrong. So I am a, a rule unto myself, the exact opposite of faith. If faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, then it must be word-based faith. Jesus said that he loves you and that he died for you and that you accept by faith. Whereas if you are in the charismatic union, then experiential religion is what you are seeking. You are seeking the evidence of God's presence in you here and now. Then it's not evidence of things not seen, but things of literally seen. If you're waiting for gold dust to fall from the sky, if you're waiting for a manifestation like being slain in the spirit, if you're waiting for a proof demonstration, then it's not faith, but reality. And if it's not faith, then it's impossible to please him. Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for what, who, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is a serious issue. Now, Tony Palmer said that the charismatic union or the charismatic movement is the glue that glues Christianity together. Forget about the doctrines, he'll sort them out upstairs. Didn't he say that? Now, I want to know the nature of the glue and I want to understand whether this can be from God or whether it is not from God. Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, he who has made himself master of the principles and texts of the word runs little risk of committing errors. A theologian should be thoroughly in possession of the basis and source, source of faith. That is to say, the Holy Scriptures. Armed with this knowledge, it was that I confounded and silenced all my adversaries, for they seek not to fathom and understand the Scriptures. They run them over negligently and drowsily. They speak, they write, they teach according to the suggestions of their heedless imaginations. My counsel is that we draw water from the true source and fountain, that is, that we diligently search the Scriptures, Martin Luther in Table Talk. Now what the third person is, the holy evangelists and John teachers, 
where he says, But when the Comforter is come, which I will send unto you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Here Christ speaks not only of the office and work of the Holy Ghost, but also of his substance and faith. He goes out or proceeds from the Father, that is, he's going out or his proceeding is without all beginning and everlasting. Therefore the Holy Prophet Joel gives him the name and calls him the Spirit of the Lord. This is Martin Luther. I'm just giving a little bit of reformed thinking. He continues. The Son suffers himself to be given to the world and to be lifted up on the cross as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. To this work comes afterwards the third person, the Holy Ghost, who kindles faith in the heart through the word and so regenerates us and makes us the children of God. I, I see nothing to apologize for in these statements. We ought not to criticize, explain, or judge the scriptures by our mere reason, but diligently with prayer meditate thereon and seek their meaning. The devil and temptations also afford us occasion to learn and understand the scriptures by experience and practice. Without these, we should never understand them, however diligently we read and listen to them. The Holy Ghost must here be our only master and tutor, and let youth have no shame to learn of that preceptor. When I find myself assailed by temptation, I forthwith lay hold of some text of the Bible, which Jesus extends to me, as this, that he died for me, whence I derive infinite comfort. I don't need to see it. I don't need to touch it. I don't need to experience it. It says so. Therefore, it is so. That's faith. That's faith. We read in Acts of the Apostles, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a mere human construction on them. But the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding. Silence is golden. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit and the work and how he is or what he is, the, we know what he has to do. Leave it at that. Leave it at that. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When he come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. To the repentant sinner, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the Holy Spirit reveals the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He will receive of mine and shall show it unto you, Christ said. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 14, 14, 26. So this is the office of the Holy Spirit. We are told what he will do and that should suffice. It is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy. Under extraordinary circumstances, holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender of the world to God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness, as well as in light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestionable confidence and resting in His love. So it's walking by faith and not by sight. I don't have to go to a special meeting to experience a euphoric manifestation in order to know that God is concerned about my well-being. He died for me on the cross. He's concerned by faith. Accept it. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. 
Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, which proceeds from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself. And these are very important concepts. John 14, 16. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What's the second one? Thy word is truth. The third one, all thy commandments are truth. Three definitions, that's all, in the Bible. So if he's the spirit of truth, he must lead to Christ. He must lead to the word, and he must lead to obedience. Otherwise, he's not the spirit of truth, he's the spirit of the lie. Simple. And aren't we told to test the spirits? And this spirit of truth, the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, here's a very, very important point. Who doesn't know him? The world doesn't know him. Who does know him? God's people know him. I want you to remember that. File that in your filing cabinet. It's the world that doesn't know the Holy Spirit. But God's people know the Holy Spirit. How do they know him? Because he's led them to Christ, to his word and to his law. That's how they know the Holy Spirit. Those three criteria. If he's the spirit of truth... He leads you to Christ, he leads you to the Word, and he leads you to the law. That's it. And the world doesn't know him. I will not leave you comfortless. Jesus speaking. I will come to you. But Jesus says it's expedient that I go away so that the comforter may come. So how does Christ continue to communicate with his children? Through the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit in this context? Spirit of Christ. And if God, the Father, and Jesus Christ are one and the same, can we say it's the Spirit of God? But exactly what he is and what he looks like and whether I will whatever... The Bible says nothing about it, so accept it for what it is. So let's have a look again in John chapter 16. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. All truth, and we've identified what truth is. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Whatever you shall hear, that must be God the Father, God the Son, right? And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify Jesus, because this is Jesus speaking. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So whose words will the Spirit speak? The words of Jesus. Now this is all very important. This is very important. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Christ says, speaking of the Comforter, he shall not speak of himself, he shall testify of me, he shall glorify me. How little has Christ been preached? The laborers have presented theories, plenty of them, but little of Christ and his love. As the Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of, the lo of his love, so the Spirit came to glorify Christ by revealing to the world the riches of his love and grace. Is that in harmony with Scripture? If the Holy Spirit dwells in us, our work will testify to the fact we shall lift up Jesus. Not one can afford to be silent now. The burden of the work is to present Christ to the world. All who venture to have their own way, who do not join the angels who are sent from heaven with a message to fill the whole earth with its glory, will be passed by. 
The work will go forward to victory without them, and they will have no part in its triumph. So when we preach the three angels' messages, including the warning against the mark of the beast, it means that you must accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, which will be manifest in good works, including keeping the commandments of God, and the Sabbath will be the pivotal relationship law in that issue. That's what it means. And salvation is only through the Creator and the Redeemer, and that's Jesus Christ, who created all things by Jesus Christ. John 16, 8 says, And when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now the Protestant world long ago through Robert Schuller said there's nothing worse than speaking about people's sin. We must forget about it. So he's saying that the work of the Holy Spirit is not important. It's a very strange doctrine indeed. Sin, righteousness and judgment. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You cannot remember anything if you don't read the word. He won't pour information and lead you apart from his word. He will always work through the word. And we, Acts 5.32, are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. So obedience is a criterion. Now let's, let's look at the charismatic movement in that sense. This movement fames itself in speaking in tongues. The definition of speaking in tongues we find in Acts chapter 2, where they spoke in their mother tongue, 17 languages listed, and they received the gift of communicating the gospel in different languages, and the Gentiles received this gift as they did. Today, we have the manifestation of a gift where the mind is excluded and a feeling and a nonsensical utterance is expressed. And I go back to this verse in Isaiah where it describes the function of the Spirit in Christ. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots, referring to Jesus. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. And if I go to Corinthians, where Paul addresses this issue in the Corinthian church, and you must remember that the Corinthians were not exactly exemplary at that stage, and 1 Corinthians is a rebuke to their doctrines, and it's written in an antithetical parallelism. This is what you do, but this is the right way. This is what you do, but this is the right way. And we go to 1 Corinthians 14, 14, it says, For I pr if I pray in an unknown tongue, unknown is not in the original. If I pray in a tongue and my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. That's what they were doing. Then he says, what is this then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with my understanding also. God will never bypass your cognitive function. Never. He didn't give you the gift of understanding. He didn't give you a gift of choice to bypass it. And when he was lifted up and he was dying on a cross, he did it because he honored your freedom of choice. So, if I pray, I will pray with the Spirit, but I'll pray with my understanding also. I'm not going to bypass my brain. And I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with my understanding also. I'm not going to sing brainless stuff that means nothing to me and puts me in a euphoric state. 
I want to know what I'm singing. I want to know what I'm doing. So beware of anything that is repetitive or chantive or based on syncopated rhythm or whatever. Never, ever allow the mind to be bypassed. Music must be worshipful. Music must be melodious. It must be harmonious. That cuts out a whole spectrum of things. That cuts out all rock music, all heavy metal, all rap, because it's none of those things. And it's harmony that's the intelligent side of music. And therefore, it must be incorporated in worshipful music. And it must be something that you can use your mind and apply your mind to. It mustn't be repetitive, garbled information. So now let's have a look at this in connection with the Catholic charismatic movement where Tony Palmer said that being an evangelical and being invited into this movement he found no difference because the manifestations were identical. And based on the manifestations which were identical he assumed that they were perfectly in order with God. But then he should have gone a step further and he said you find the same manifestation in Hinduism. You find the same manifestations in shamanism. You find the same manifestations in voodooism. Are they all acceptable? The Second Vatican Council and the Charismatic Renewal on the 25th of January 1959, only two months after his election as Pope, John the 23rd surprised the world with announcing this great Second Vatican Council. And what was it about? The possibility to contribute more efficaciously to the solution of the problems of the modern world. The joyful echo brought about by its announcement as well as the lively interest on part of non-Catholics and even non-Christians proved in the most eloquent manner the historical importance of the event which has not escaped anyone. So now he's been canonized because of this work. He's such an important work, bringing them all together again, that he is now a saint. Vatican II and the Charismatic View Movement. Cardinal Joseph Sunens, Templeton Prize winner, also a Mason, initiated on June 15, 1967, chosen by Pope John XXIII to be one of the chief architects of Vatican II meetings, served on all four committees, states, Since I've had this charismatic experience, my allegiance to the Holy Father as the Vicar of Christ, uh, excuse me, what's the function of the Holy Spirit? To lead to whom? To Christ. Not the Vicar of Christ. To Christ. Has been heightened and strengthened. My appreciation for Mary as the co-redemptress and mediatoress of my salvation has been assured. Uh, the Bible says there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. We have an advocate with the Father, the man Christ Jesus. Now we have Mary here. Now if the function of the Holy Spirit is to lead to Christ, but his experience in Mary as his mediator and advocate has been increased. Is it the Holy Spirit or is it another spirit? It must be another spirit. My appreciation of the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ has now been heightened. The Bible says, by one sacrifice he has forever made perfect. Here you have another sacrifice. Uh, is the sacrifice of Christ insufficient so that you would have a repetitive sacrifice here in the form of the Mass. Now if the Holy Spirit leads to truth, which is the Word, then what is this? This must be another spirit. And this is the charismatic movement of the Roman Catholic Church. Vatican II says about the charisms, it is not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God. Excuse me. Where in the Bible does it tell you that you have to perform a particular ritual in order to be sanctified, like a sacrament? 
Nowhere. So here's another spirit giving you another path, whereas the Bible says there's no other way except through Christ Jesus. Here is a works-based criterion. Okay. He distributes special graces amongst the faithful of every rank. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. I quote the Bible. These charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they are exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. What does the Holy Spirit do again? He leads you to the Word. He leads you to Jesus. He leads you to obedience to the commandments. But here, he satisfies the needs of the church and not the sole needs of the seeker for truth. John Paul II and the charismatic renewal, while speaking to a half a million of Pentecostal Catholics, he said, Open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit. Accept gratefully and obediently the charisms which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. All right? Is that biblical? Doesn't the Bible say, Test the spirits? This one says, no, whatever the Spirit's going to give you, accept it docilely. Don't question it. Just take it. It's not biblical. And then he prayed, come, Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth. Who is he addressing? He's addressing the Holy Spirit. Come with your seven gifts. Come, Spirit of life, Spirit of communion and love. The church and the world need you. Come, Holy Spirit, make ever more fruitful the charisms you have bestowed on us. Give new strength and missionary zeal to these sons and daughters of yours who have gathered here. Open their hearts, renew their Christian commitment to the world, make them courageous messengers of the gospel, witnesses to the risen Jesus Christ. There are some nice words in there. The Redeemer and Savior of man, strengthen their love and their fidelity to the church. And then he stated boldly, the movements are the hope of the church. And Ratzinger said the same thing. And then in 2006, Benedict was present at this vigil of Pentecost. The unknown God. Excuse me, didn't the Bible, Bible say the only ones who don't know him are whom? The world. the world. But the ones who do know him are the people of God. Isn't that correct? So the Holy Spirit should never be an unknown God. The Holy Spirit considered until a few years ago as the unknown God. By whom? So are they, are they admitting that they never knew him? Is the one who with his grace tirelessly changes the lives of thousands of people in all corners of the world who with renewed joy through the experience of the baptism in the Spirit begin a new life, live precisely in the Holy Spirit. He is the one we wish to honor and glorify publicly. When he comes, he will not speak of himself. He will glorify Jesus. Here is another, here's another spirit. He's being addressed directly and he is the one they wish to glorify publicly. Now, this is really phenomenal. You see, the Bible says nobody comes to the Father except by Jesus. So the devil doesn't mind if the new Israel movement in the world negates Jesus and it comes to the Father directly. That's fine. I mean, the other religions too do that. Don't the Jews do it? Don't they go directly to the Father because they negate the Son? That's fine. And now we have another movement which goes directly to the Spirit, who again is being sidelined. Jesus. And they are knocking on two doors 
Father door, spirit door, but there's only one door that gives access to both. And that's Jesus. And if you want to know what the Father is like, you have to look at Jesus. If you want to understand the character of the Godhead, you have to go through Jesus. You have to understand Jesus. So this is a new religion. So this is the one we wish to honor, glorify publicly, responding to the appeal that both John Paul II as well as Benedict made to the Catholic charismatic renewal and the whole church to spread the culture of Pentecost, the action of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and in each of the faithful, the director added. This celebration, which will include moments of prayer, now you must listen to this carefully, this is the Catholic speaking, listening, Witnessing an invocation of the Spirit will end with the celebration of prayer, a music concert, and a dance, which will be presented as prayer by artists of different countries, and all to give glory to the Holy Spirit and to thank Him for all He does every day in our lives. And Tony Palmer said that the manifestations there we're exactly the same as in the evangelical world, so there's no reason why we cannot become one. No reason. And the pontifical household preacher, Father Tom Forrest, one of the initiators of the charismatic experience, will speak on grace and the power of the Holy Spirit during the celebration in Marina. So the glue is at work, but the glue, according to the definition of the Bible, is not from God. It cannot be because it does the opposite work of that which is described in the Word. So the next step would be to unite the entire world, religious systems. If we can unite the Christian system, then all we have to do is unite the Christian system with all the other systems of the world, and then the entire world will have negated Jesus Christ. The entire world. So Pope calls for all religions to unite. And he made this call in March 21, on March 21, 2013. He urged members of all religions and those belonging to no church to unite to defend justice, peace and the environment there's no gospel there. And not allow the value of a person to be reduced to what he produces and what he consumes. All right, so he's talking to Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and asking them to unite. And just a brief while after that public announcement that all the world's religions must unite, 18 September 2014, the World Alliance of Religions for Peace Summit was held in Seoul, Korea. We are one. Fascinating. A massive stadium filled with thousands of people celebrating the unity of religion. And here is the signing ceremony in Seoul, Korea. Politicians of the world were there to sign an agreement for world peace and the religious leaders of the world. Now what is fascinating, when we look at this little video clip, we'll see that the Catholic Church is there, all the pagan religions are there, the Anglican is there, but there's no representative other than the Anglicans of the individual Protestant churches. Let's look at it. Peace will not be achieved without our every effort. Peace will be reached when everybody makes it their duty to become a messenger of peace for their nation and their societies. Today we are not only here in our professional capacities, but as those who carry the heart of a peace advocate within us. World peace, we the youth believe, can only be achieved 
when all aspects, when all people come together as one. And in the past three days, you have seen that the youth, we have done all we can within our capacity. But we are looking upon the leaders right now, the leaders of the international community, the politicians, the lawmakers, and the religious leaders to help us fulfill this goal. Signing this agreement, it may not bring peace immediately, ladies and gentlemen, but what I'd like to say is that it is a step in the right direction and the youth need your help. So now we will we'll proceed with the signing ceremony of the Unity of Religion Agreement. The Unity of Religion Agreement is a groundbreaking promise of religions to unite condition unconditionally and without discrimination to achieve true peace. I would like to call upon the following religious leaders to come up to the stage and join us for the signing of the ceremony of the Unity of Religions Agreement. First, Archbishop Martin de Jesus Barahona to please come up to the stage. Also, a representative of Holiness Sharukirti Panditak Hariyavari Aswam Swati Sri Bataraka to come to the stage. Also, from the Islam Shia faith, El Sharif Muhammad Hassan El Armini to come to the stage. From the Hinduism faith, His Holiness Swami Shidadanda Saraswatiji Maharaj, the Guru of India. From the faith of Buddhism, Representative Dr. Ashin Nyani Sara, founder of the Sitaku Buddha Vihara. Would you please make your way to the stage? From the Catholic Church, Archbishop Antonio Ledesma from the Philippines. From the Anglican Church, Archbishop Patricio Inlique Viveros Robles. From the Sikh religion, Singh Sahib Jana Gurbacha and Singhji. If you could make your, way, make your way to the stage, please. From the Jewish faith, Rabbi Jeremy Yehuda Milgrom. From the Zoroaster faith, Dr. Meher Master Moose. And from the Baha'i faith, Dr. Bharati Gandhi. At this time, we would also like to call upon the host of the World Alliance of Religions Peace Summit. Firstly, Mr. Man Hee Lee, the chairman of HWPL, and also Ms. Nam Hee Kim, the president of IWPG. Let's give them a great applause. Uh, while the proceedings continue on stage, uh, we will conduct the signing ceremony of the agreement to propose the enactment of an international law for the cessation of war and world peace just below stage with our delegations. And to establish peace, for the heritage of peace to be brought to all generations. We must do everything in our power to end all wars on this earth and to establish world peace according to the will of the Creator, God. Therefore, all religions must unite under God as one. We pledge in sight of God, all people of the world, and the peace advocate to become under God through the unity of religion. We hereby acknowledge that we must be recreated through God's seed so that we might be recognized as the family of God. And in that likeness, shine an eternal light upon the earth, loving our neighbors as ourselves. We recognize our need for repentance 
as well as our need to show grace to all the people of the world. Grace which can be seen in the light, rain and the air of heaven. And through that grace, lead humanity to salvation from death. That is quite phenomenal. That last sentence was pantheism in its fullness. And the Bible says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods beside me. By affixing that signature to that document, who has been written out of the Constitution? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been written out of the Constitution for the sake of world peace. And in 2017, at the Jubilee of Jubilees, the Protestant world will perhaps officially apologize for the Reformation and join the unity of religion to say we have no other king save Caesar. Ezekiel 7.25, destruction cometh and they seek peace and there shall be none. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. May the Lord grant us wisdom. I am not saying the end of the world is in 2017, lest I be misconstrued. What I am saying is the cards are on the table. To repeat history as the Jewish nation did when they rejected Jesus Christ and crucified him. And they thought they were doing it for peace and they got sudden destruction. And the same will happen when the Christian world signs away their allegiance to no other God than the one who created and redeemed them. They will have followed in the footsteps of the Pharisees and the scribes and the people of Israel together with the Romans in the times of Jesus. And I believe that we as a people must be prepared for what is coming upon the world because our message is diametrically opposed to this message. May God help us. Amen. Thank you.